you ever researched how to make money blogging, then you might have seen dreamy images of somebody traveling the world, being paid while they do it, and a destination more exotic than the last. These people are living the dream. But then you read the comments and you see things like, nobody really lives like this. Bloggers don't really make that much money. No one gets paid to travel. Oh, they do. And you're gonna hear from one of them today. Hi, it's Kayla here from Writing From Nowhere. Today I'm interviewing Jessie from jessieonajourney.com. Jessie is an incredible travel blogger. She's had her blog for 10 years. There were just so many nuggets of gold in this conversation and she even showed us her planner and how to schedule your weeks to get the most done possible for your blog. All of her advice is amazing. So let's dive in. Thank you so much for being with us here today, Jessie. Do you want to introduce yourself for everybody? Hey everyone, I am Jessie Festa. I am the travel blogger behind Jessie on a Journey, an Epicurean culture. And I got started with all of this in 2011 when I basically was trying to figure out how I could continue traveling, which is something I loved, while also using my master's degree or, you know, just figuring out how to get a full time job in travel. And I wasn't finding any jobs in the market that I liked. So I saw in my research these people called bloggers, which I didn't even know what that was at the time, writing about their trips and making money from it. So I kind of pursued it super aggressively and was able to go full time within a year. There's like pros and cons, I think, to like starting back then and now. Back then, it definitely was like less competition, but there was way less opportunities. So for anyone who might be thinking like, oh, that sounds interesting, but is it too late? I definitely don't think it's too late. And the good thing is there's so many different ways to, you know, build a blog and monetize and all of that nowadays. Oh, I love that you touched on that, like the now versus then, because I've heard it so many times as well that it's like too hard now, but it was also really hard back then because you couldn't go on YouTube and watch a tutorial for everything. And podcasts, yeah. I don't think existed, at least not in like the capacity. There was not yeah. access to creators for advice which must have been really different. Like, how did you research back then? Were you like, I mean, of course, it's not like that was prehistoric and there was no internet or anything, but even the resources online, just so limited. Yeah, there was a course. So I took a course, it doesn't even exist anymore, but there was one. Um, so that was helpful. But the thing was like, you, I went on a few press trips, but being a blogger, trying to get a press trip was really hard. People did not take you seriously. and. I don't think anyone was getting paid for press trips. Like nowadays when I take a press mm -hmm. trip, I'm typically paid for it as a creator. Cause you know, whether you're a blogger, YouTuber, TikTok or whatever, brands will take you seriously if you've built up that audience and that personal brand. Back then that really wasn't a thing. <laughs> mm. And there was even some animosity in the industry, I think, because I have a degree in journalism and PR. And I know that that is something that they, like that comes up a lot in the magazine industry. Like magazines did not like bloggers because they were writing things for free and magazines were for profit. And oh yeah, a lot's changed though. And <laughs> yes, I definitely encountered that on press trips. I always felt like, I definitely felt those tensions and I felt like I constantly had to like, explain myself and be like, no, I'm, you know, I'm really taking this seriously. And <laughs> I am a professional person. Like it definitely was not seen as something professional. Mm. And were your degrees, either your bachelor's or your master's, were these, did, I mean, I'm sure everything in life like prepares you to start your own, everyone's online business, but did they like tangibly prepare you or were you like beginner, beginner whenever you started? I have a communication degree, so I'm sure it did. I mean, I don't know, I felt like a lot of my courses were like about theories and stuff that I'm not even, like I I wasn't really, what, how do I wanna say this? In college, we didn't really have social media like we do now. Like the tools that I'm using and stuff didn't exist. Like we just got Facebook and that was to find college parties. There was, you know, <laughs> it's just so different. So I'm sure it did prepare me in some ways. I also took PR classes and journalism classes. So those things I think helped more like i'd say there were specific classes that helped me hone interview skills and things like that but just this digital world that we have now wasn't it was in its infancy i'd say so yes and no <laughs> yeah and that's like one half of the battle i think and i don't even know which half is worse i guess it depends on each person but there's like the technical skills hurdles but then there's also all those emotional hurdles and I'd love if you could just kind of walk us through like what were the hardest things getting started? Like what were the good feelings, the emotions, but also the negative ones? Like 
Were you worried that people, like for some reason, I feel like so many beginners have this feeling of like, what, who are they, you know? And all of those, I don't know. I think we all worked through those in some capacity. So I'd love to hear what you worked through and what that was like. Yeah, so I'd say the positives was, well, two things, I guess. Um, I started my blog as to help solo female travelers. So I loved sharing my experiences to help that community because back then also there wasn't a ton of resources for travelers, like especially solo female travelers. There was a few forums, but so I liked being able to help people in that way. I also love the feeling of there being no income ceiling, but also no cap on the possibilities of what you can do. Like new projects can come your way. You're your own boss. So you decide what you do. So I think that keeps things interesting both then and even more now. And then in terms of sort of emotional hurdles, definitely my process. It was very, um, I guess, workaholic hustle mm. kind of thing. I felt like I was almost just thinking it was quantity over quality. And I was just trying to get stuff out, get stuff out, get stuff out which A, was a terrible strategy, and B, was unhealthy. Like, it didn't make me enjoy what I was doing, which, I mean, I started a travel blog because A, I wanted to make money, but B, I wanted to enjoy what I did. So over the years, I've definitely finessed my process so that I actually enjoy what I'm doing. Not saying every second I enjoy what I'm doing, but overall, I'm not like getting straight up out of bed, going right to the laptop and like typing away until I go to bed just to get stuff out. I'm really thinking about what I'm putting out there. I'm taking breaks things like that. So definitely it's hard work. You're going to have to do a lot to start any type of business, whether it's a blog or an online shop or a brick and mortar. But I think you can kind of take account of what you're doing, the things that you really like, how you can spend more time on that and enjoy your process. And then as you build, it'll start to allow you to know what you also want to outsource. So if there's mm. something you really hate, I do think before you outsource, you should understand that thing so that you can also kind of like oversee it. But you might say, you know what? I understand how to create, like, you know, you have your Pinterest consulting. I'm not that great at Pinterest and I'm horrible at graphic design. So I outsource the graphic design. It's not like I don't get it. Mm, I understand yeah. that it's necessary and how it works, but I'm not good at it and I don't enjoy it. Mm. So it's, I think it's helpful to also pinpoint those things. Oh, I love that. And outsourcing, yeah, it's one of those things in the beginning, I think you always think if I had money, I would dot, dot, dot. And I actually got a piece of advice on a podcast. The, the host said to write those things down so that whenever you do have money, you can outsource. And I wrote down, the first thing on my list was SEO whenever I was blogging, cause I didn't understand it. And I felt so embarrassed and I don't know. So like overwhelmed. And then I ended up learning it. And now that's part of what I sell is like SEO writing. And um, I love that you hit on that too. Like don't just outsource. Some people listening will have funds to invest. And I think that's a really good point to make to be able to figure something out for yourself. Yeah. And I think even with like say SEO, because it's kind of complicated, it takes time to learn. I think before you outsource it, you should still know it yourself and then say, you know what? I understand it. I don't like it. And I, outsourcing this might save me time because I feel like if you outsource it before you understand it, you may not really understand if it's working, I guess like mm. you could say. I tried outsourcing that once and it was a lot of money and I ultimately decided I could do a better job myself. <laughs> Yeah, I see it a lot with Pinterest too, where people hire someone and then they, or they ask their VA to do it, but they don't really know what they're doing. And um, <laughs> sometimes I get in there and I'm like, oh my gosh, what happened? <laughs> and so, <laughs> and then you feel so bad because people spent money on something that they didn't understand. And yeah, that's a complicated kind of, I guess that's an issue for down the road for most people, but it's something good to think about like well in advance. <laughs> And I'm yeah. also, speaking of like the very beginning, I'm really curious to hear what went well for you in that first year. There's like always struggles to talk about, but what were like the big wins? And you said that you went full time within a year. So a lot went well, but if you could identify anything. Yeah, so one of the biggest or the best decisions I made was pitching um, publication. So I started freelance writing to make money while I built up my site, but I pitched a huge publication at the time. It doesn't really exist anymore. It was called Gadling. Hmm. And you know, this is inspiration for anyone who's like, Oh, I want to pitch this editor brand insert, whatever here, but I'm too small. Or why should I, 
I shouldn't have. I was brand new. I had barely any experience. I pitched this editor and I lived in Brooklyn or near Brooklyn. And he's like, oh, that's so funny. I live in Chicago, but I'm in Brooklyn right now. Would you want to grab a beer tomorrow and we could chat? Met him and another person from the team for a beer. And they're just like, oh yeah, this isn't really an interview. We just wanted to meet you. You totally can write for us. And that ended up being full-time income in itself for me. Um, But it allowed me also to be super flexible with my time to kind of write content and learn. I mean, SEO was definitely something super helpful for traffic. And because I was really consistent with writing, you know, it's like, I guess it was kind of a good and a bad thing in the beginning that I was such a hustler. Going back, I still think I would have finessed my process because I was very unhappy (laughs) and unhealthy (laughs) at the time. But you know, I did take the time to hone my writing skills, my photography skills, um, which I now sell my photography. I have a whole photography business right after this. I'm meeting a client for a photo shoot. Like that's a huge way I now monetize my business. But, you know, honing those important writing, SEO and photography skills allowed me to grow my traffic. But also I was landing a lot of sponsored posts at the time, which I feel like that was a huge way to make money then. Mm. Now I'm super, super, super choosy with anyone I create sponsored content with. But um, yeah, that was kind of focusing on those three things helped me a lot in the beginning. There was Facebook and Twitter back then, but social media was really just like, I feel like I would just throw posts up there. I didn't really have a social strategy. So Mm -hmm. I can't really say that even helped me so much. Um, But another thing was because I was writing for these bigger publications, people were starting to take me seriously and starting to take my blog a bit more seriously. So you know, on someone's blog, the as seen on banner. Oh yeah. Basically like, I guess building that kind of banner, whether literally or figuratively. Yeah. Um, or not figuratively, but you know, even if you don't have a physical banner, you're building those bylines. Um, that was super helpful. Mm. And just to break it down for anybody who's listening and just to like put it all out there visually. So you were blogging, but um, alongside that you started freelance writing. And that's something a lot of, it, there's kind of a nuance in the blogging world where I feel like there's the free, like blogging, making money from blogging. It's like people think of passive. You're like making money in your sleep, but then there's also like a blog is a million opportunities for a service-based business. Like yeah. you started writing and I started doing Pinterest management and writing as well off of my blog. And I think that it's a really natural first step to, and that's something that we actually just talked about um, in a guest post, if anybody, I'll link it in the description about becoming a digital nomad. Uh, I published on Jesse's site about how it makes a lot of sense to start services and then transition into like the bigger picture because it doesn't happen instantly. And it can almost break a good idea, I think, to try to put too much pressure on it. Would you agree with that? Yes. Yeah, and I think like, you know, I have online courses and my students are always like, you have so many opt-in freebies, you have so many courses, you have all these different tours, you have these photography packages. I'm like, these things took me years to create. Like this wasn't like in one day, I'm like, let me create all these different quizzes and free, my free resource library and whatever. This is years and years and years of buildup. So, you know, start slow and realize that it is just like any business. You're gonna have to create your brand first. Then you're gonna have to create your content strategy. Then you're gonna, you know, use that to hopefully funnel people to whatever it is, your product, services, affiliate link. If you run ads on your site, you know, whatever that is, but it's a process. It doesn't happen in a month or even for many people, you know, you might go full-time in a year or you might make enough money to be fulfilled full-time, but likely to scale that is going to take more than a year, I think. Mm, Yeah, I would say the majority of people change niches as well, or change directions within a niche quite drastically. It definitely feels like shoots and ladders where you're like going up and then all of a sudden you like slink back four rows because you lose rankings. You also feel lost. Like I transferred from being in the eco niche to being in the remote work niche and I know I didn't even look at my website for like two months because I felt like I didn't like recognize what I was seeing in the mirror and kind of the emotional side of that as well is it's a big decision for people who are new. There's a lot of pressure to kind of get it right the first time, but almost no one does. Yeah. And I think that comes with like, when you're first starting a blog, you've never written that kind of content. So how do you really know your style, your personality, what you like, what you're going to be excited to write about? I think it takes actually putting your finger on the keyboard to understand that. And then I totally get what you're saying with like not touching it for two months. Cause you were like, 
you know, confused and overwhelmed. I think too, like when you show up to your laptop and you're like, what do people want to hear from me? What should I write? That's like, ugh, that's like a crappy feeling. I've totally been there too. Once you can nail that like niche and maybe have three categories or five categories, whatever makes sense for you and kind of say, today I'm going to write about this today. Tomorrow I'm going to write about that. It becomes so much more fulfilling in my opinion, knowing mm. exactly what people want to hear from you is such a good feeling. But yeah, sometimes that takes practice and figuring out what's going to work for you. And that's totally okay. Yeah. And I'm curious if you could uh, tell us a little bit about your travel membership, which is called Travel Blog Prosperity. So it's an amazing membership for every, anyone who's not familiar. I'm in it and I love it. I'll just go in there on slow days and binge stuff. It's so nice. And what's some of the advice that you give in there like all the time? If you, you know, maybe something comes to mind that like you're always repeating to people or encouragement or problems. What are some of those like hurdles that you're always helping people over? Yeah, I'll give you two. Actually, one will be visual. Oh. <laughs> um, so one of the, I'll say basic, we keep talking about SEO tips that I always tell people because we're just talking about niches. A lot of people, you know, we're multifaceted. You want to write about everything. I do think, of course, you can do that. There's so many different ways to see success. But I think nowadays honing in on a specific topic so that A, your audience knows what to expect from you. B, you know what to write and C, I feel like this is the best like non-technical SEO tip. It makes it so much easier to rank if you're always writing about something. Maybe people have heard the idea of like niching down. I would say, just think of it like this. If you're starting a travel blog, that's gonna be super hard to rank for, right? There's family travel, solo travel, RV travel, budget, oh, yeah. luxury, so many different kinds. But if you're like solo travel, even just start there. And if then you say, I wanna niche down even further, that's fine. But at least pick a category so you have a specific audience and direction and start there. You don't even need to figure everything out on day one, but consistently writing about the same topics helps you rank. Like for me, I started as a solo travel blog. I rank very well for solo travel content. I rank very well for hiking content because I hike mm. on every trip. That's like my main thing when I go somewhere, I'm like, I have to find at least one good hike. So I rank well for hiking content and I rank really well for New York travel content because I live here and I write about it a lot. So I do write a lot of, like, I try to blend them. I have a post on hiking in Manhattan, which, you know, who knew, but you yeah. know, there's urban hikes here. Yeah. Um, I've written about fun things to do alone in New York city. So I try to also mm. weave those things and it makes it even easier to rank. Um, yeah. So that's one tip. But then the other people are always curious how to organize themselves. And I've developed this little system. It's like planner with answer key type thing. So oh. basically, I have this piece of paper that I always just have in my planner. It's just literally a scrap paper and it says all the months of the year and what my big focus will be. So mm -hmm. a lot of times that could be like, you know, I'm part of the Genius Bloggers Toolkit. So this month, that's gonna be a thing. Relaunching the membership. I'm part of a summit another month. Another month I'm doing a giveaway. Or if you don't really have products or things you're doing, it could be um, building up one of your content categories. Like I'm gonna spend a month writing about different solo female travel guides. Um, pick one focus that's gonna be related to monetization or traffic, you know, some type of growth. And then in my planner, each month at the top, it says priority. So I write, I break up my month into four sprints and it's um, content and outreach. So writing blog posts, also reaching out to, you know, potential guest teachers for Travel Blog Prosperity, potential affiliates for my courses and tours, um, opportunities to be on podcasts, things like that. So I'll spend that week doing that. Another week is promo planning. That's where this key comes in. I spend that week uh, doing the necessary um, like creating the content for that promotion. So let's say I'm looking at April genius bloggers toolkit. Okay. In March, I am going to create all the content necessary to promote that. My other month is, or my other week is getting the travel blog prosperity content ready. And then the final week is overflow. Whatever I didn't don't feel like I completed for the month. I'll spend that week doing that. So that's how I break mm -hmm. things up. And I found it super helpful to stay consistent and know exactly what promotions I'm focusing on. Um, 
you know, it could be anything. Like I said, like maybe you're like, oh my gosh, I have so many broken links. Maybe you spend that week cleaning up all those links and fixing up all that content. So that helps keep me organized. I found that super helpful. And I share that with my students all the time. They're always like, oh, how do I stay organized? Wow. I love the concept of having the last week of the month be for overflow. That is amazing. Because we all have so many like, <laughs> oh, I have to, I have like a bunch of images I have to fix. I have broken links, like all these little things that you put off and put off. And then it's like, oh my gosh, now I have 20 things that are just in the overflow pile. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that concept. I'm going to implement that immediately because that's something <laughs> I don't do well with. I take on too many ideas and then think, you know, if I work late enough, enough nights, I can squeeze them in. But then you fall into those balance issues, like you mentioned. And yeah. gosh, it's hard to stay out of there. <laughs> I feel like some people I know, like, I think it's helpful to test uh, if you're more of like a, a day person or a week person person in terms of organization. I know a lot of people like to leave overflow for Friday. That just doesn't work for me because I'm still like, if I didn't finish, I don't know. I just feel like having a focus for the week works for me. Cause I get in a little more of like a flow state. Mm. Um, but I know people that hate the weeks and they prefer like Monday is social media day, Tuesday is a blog post day, Wednesday is an outreach day, you know, whatever. Yeah. But yeah, I like, if I'm creating my promo assets for something, I don't like to move on to the next thing till that's done. That's just my personality. Yeah. Yeah. The days didn't work for me either. I also really like to have freedom within the week and then you can like run with ideas that you get. And I always like to leave Saturday as like a free form day with nothing on the agenda to do anything. And it's kind of nice as to like have time to waste sometimes, you know, like just yeah. trying something out and um, not putting pressure on everything to like result in something like not every blog post is going to become a big winner and not you know it's i guess maybe it's like comes down to the 80 20 rule that 80 percent of your results will come from 20 percent of your efforts but yeah um, not being afraid to experiment and maybe that's a good tip as well for beginners which is so yeah. hard because everything feels like you don't know anything so everything feels like an experiment <laughs> but you have to find what works for you personally yeah and i think too it's like focus on one thing at a time like again it's a it's a process if you're like okay i want to learn pinterest don't try to learn Instagram and Facebook and TikTok and all these other things at the same time. Learn that, get your repeatable workflow, and then move on once you feel confident that you have that, like, you know, something you feel confident repeating and kind of leaving time to look at your results. But I also like the week because, say like Pinterest, if Monday is your Pinterest day and suddenly you have, you're sick, and you can't work that day, now you're gonna be like, oh, I'm so behind. But if the whole week is social media, I think you have a little more flow. Like, okay, Monday I was sick, but I can catch up on Tuesday and that's okay. Mm, yeah, I love that. Uh, that like freedom and flexibility. And maybe this is a little bit redundant from the last question, but I'm curious what things you would do from day one now. Like it could be something like, have every blog post be automatically tweeted. This is something I just set up last week that I wish I had done from day one. Maybe these like tangibles, maybe tools, or is there anything that you haven't touched on already in terms of like the blog itself? Like what would you do differently from the very beginning? Yeah, I would definitely, well, one, I would have focused on SEO. I would have learned SEO before I even wrote anything because mm -hmm. there's so many, like I found a, blog post the other day that I, I apparently used to take photos and like just put a photo up and put a caption and publish that as a blog post like just those like really thin content things I used to do to get content out I would definitely instead focus on the quality over quantity those long form in-depth posts and creating that um basically I'll try to say this in a non-confusing way like creating a spider web on your site mm, so yes. if I wrote about uh, how to pack for New York City, then maybe I write how to pack for New York City in summer and link that. And mm -hmm. uh, maybe I create like, um, you know, just posts that you can interlink between each other. I definitely would have focused on that. Um, and then building an email list. Oh, yeah. I didn't do that till so long in. And now, honestly, that's how I make for the courses, especially 99.9% .9 of my students come through my email list. Um, a lot of traffic comes from my email list, like outside of Google, I get way more traffic from my email list than I do from Instagram or Twitter. Yeah. Instagram is so. not a traffic source. I know a lot of yeah. bloggers invest a lot there. It's not a traffic source because people aren't 
used to clicking. It's not convenient to click. They don't really want to go to your LinkedIn bio. And also it's not searchable, which is a difference. Whenever you're like looking at all the platforms, I know it can be a lot, but if it's not searchable, like for if you show up as an answer, it's not it's not going to have long-term returns for traffic <laughs> yeah and not to like dump right. on instagram it's but it's that's just a good difference and even if you like i needed to get something from somebody's instagram profile that they shared and they were an influencer they pushed a lot of content and i knew who they were and i knew what i wanted and i still couldn't find it because they published like three things a day and i saw it a year and a half ago even if you want to find it you can't on instagram sometimes so yeah, it's definitely good things to just see. keep getting pushed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's good to think about what platforms can offer you an email list. I know it's so intimidating in the beginning. And I got a subscriber, it was called the Happy Subscriber Toolkit. And it was just a list of, it was like 102, 104, two years of weekly emails pre-written with like plug and play. And um, yeah, don't be afraid of little shortcuts like that either. If it feels like you cannot do it without help then find that little boost. You know, it's not always like hiring someone to do it for you, but finding, I think it was like $54 maybe. It was very affordable given how much time it saved me. I think that's the only reason I had an email list years ago was because I had this like cheat sheet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's another good point, like investing when it makes sense. I know a lot of people in the beginning are like, well, I'm not making money yet, but think about if you were opening, opening a bakery, you'd be out six figures. So, oh, you know, yes. buying like key search or another keyword research tool, buying your hosting, a good host and buying a good theme with support. I think those three things are essential. And then, you know, maybe a course or a toolkit, something to help you learn the things you're trying to learn. Because if you're trying to learn whatever, list building, Pinterest, Instagram, if you've never done these things, especially if you've never done them from a business standpoint, that's a lot to figure out on your own from free Google articles that may or may not be outdated. Mm. If you could have a little bit of help learning from someone who's already done what you're trying to do, it can save you time. And obviously I'm saying this as a course creator, but I'm also saying this as someone who, before I said, one way I took my blog full time in a year is I, I purchased a course <laughs> and I learned how yeah. to do it so that I had a blueprint that I could kind of follow. Mm, yeah, that's so valuable and can save so much, um, like spinning of the wheels in the mud and that feeling of like not moving forward. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and it one more thing with the email list. Keep in mind too, you own your blog and you own your email list. I mean, pending you pay for your hosting. So if you pay for hosting for your blog, you own it and you own your email list. You don't own your Instagram. You don't own your social channels. You don't own your YouTube. You can get demonetized. You can get booted from the platforms. If you even get your, if you're doing everything right, but you get hacked, mm. trust me, I've been hacked on Facebook. The support from these social media platforms is almost non-existent. So I know people who have had their Instagram hacked and they've never gotten it back. So even though they were following all the rules, they still lost that whole following all that content. So these social platforms, I think are great for driving traffic and visibility and connecting with people, but don't build your whole business on them. Oh, so important. Yeah, there's, um, I, I think once you are in the world, the creator space for a while, you meet someone who's been booted off incorrectly of every platform. I've actually never met anyone who's been demonetized on YouTube. That's interesting. But I have had, I've seen accounts suspended on Pinterest for no reason and then brought back, but like months later. And um, yeah, people whose accounts have been held ransom, held <laughs> like the oh, on Instagram yeah. where they tell you, you know, you have to transfer $10,000 or we're going to deactivate your account in five days. And Instagram just shrugs. Well, <laughs> yeah, too bad. Or Facebook ads as well. A lot of people rely heavily on Facebook. Facebook ads. And I know several people who have had their accounts um, incorrectly suspended, but Pinch or Facebook has told them, uh, we can't get your ads account back. We're sorry. It's like a one strike system. And yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't <laughs> think that half the time you're talking to a human, honestly, because I, I tested it when I got hacked. At first I did. And then I started sending weird messages and they just kept replying the same thing. I'm like, you're a bot. Ah, like, <laughs> help me. But the person, I think the hacker, well, one, I have a Facebook page with a blue check. I think they wanted that because they quickly like put that in their name. Mm. Um, and I had an assistant and they booted her off. But here's another little tip. Have like literally my dad and my husband are admins on my pages and my groups because my assistant was only 
I think editor of my page. So she couldn't change passwords or anything. Have someone you super trust like as admin, because at least like if that ever happened again, my husband, I could hop on, I mean, his laptop's right there. I could hop on his Facebook and change passwords or something. Mm. Um, Cause it was, oh, it sucked. And they, the hacker, I don't think they ever did run ads, but they had set up an ad account. And I think that's what they wanted to do. Like using my credit card, oh. <laughs> <laughs> which you could deactivate your credit card, but it's, you know, you don't want that to happen. Oh, uh, yeah, then that's like the month of bounced payments. <laughs> yeah, it's it was not a good situation. It was super scary. And honestly, the only reason I got it back was tirelessly asking people, even people I barely knew anymore, like, do you know someone at Facebook? And I finally found someone that had a personal connection at Facebook who helped me. Wow, that's smart. I would have not gone yeah, that route. Yeah, it was a week of like barely any sleep, just like, going in groups and forums. And let me tell you, I was not the only one by far who was trying to get help. Thousands of people are on these forums. Help me, help me, help me, I'm hacked. Oh gosh. It's also a good reminder for everyone to update our passwords and probably <laughs> not yes. use the same one for everything, which I have done at points, but I've also been hacked on Facebook in the last six months. They sent porn to everyone in my messenger. <laughs> Yeah, that was nice. But <laughs> oh. at least I didn't spend my money. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I've definitely gotten better with like passwords. Uh, you talked about how you made money in the beginning. And I'm curious, since that was um, years ago, like you said, sponsored posts have changed a lot. Um, I would love to hear how the people in your membership are making money. So people who are starting their blogs now, what are their most fruitful ways? Like what paths are you guiding them down for income and monetization? Yeah. So for beginners, I always think, like I always tell them, be thinking about what you will want to sell at some point, products, services, the sooner you can know that, it helps mold your content. But before then, I think affiliate marketing is a great thing that you could get started with right away. I mean, some programs are picky and you have to have a certain amount of traffic, but there are definitely programs that let beginners in, like even for my tours. Like if you want to promote my New York City tours, I don't care how much traffic you have as long as your site's not spammy. And there are plenty of programs like that. So kind of teaching them how to combine affiliate marketing with SEO so that you know, if I'm writing a post on things to do in New York City and I put an affiliate link to the, the luggage I used, people looking for a guide to New York City, they may they might click that, but they're not really looking for luggage. Mm. Instead, you want to do something like, you know, best uh, backpacking backpacks for petite women. You know, if you could get really specific targeting mm -hmm. these people with keywords that they are searching when they have their credit card in hand ready to buy, yeah, that's going to be much more effective with making passive income with the affiliate marketing. Yeah. What's that called? Purchasing intent, I think. Um, <laughs> people... I think you could use any buyer intent, I call it, yeah. but purchasing intent, I feel like it's the same thing. Yeah, that's a really good thing. Whenever people are ready to pull all their credit cards and make a purchase already. I love that yeah. uh, example. You've given us so much great advice and I'd love to hear what your, as our final question before you tell us about your products and your membership, what are you most proud of from starting your blog? There's a lot of different things. I think just thinking about where I started as being super clueless to now having I think my online school has over 8,000 students. I have my tours that like basically I'm running every day. So just seeing what was possible and also thinking like, I, when I first started, I was like, I'll be happy if I make $500 a month. Then I was like, okay, I'm doing that. I'll be happy if I make $1,000 a month. And now I'm truly making like, you know, six figure business for my blog. And that to me has been so cool. And not just, you know, it's not all about money, right? Like I feel like through my products, I'm able to connect with people. I'm able to help people, whether it's through blogging, whether it's through showing them around New York city. Um, and I take pictures of people. So they leave with photos to Aww. cherish forever of their trip. So, you know, I'm really proud of the products I've created, which by the way, have all come from keeping track of the questions people ask me. Mm. When I started my blog, I wasn't thinking I would ever start a tour company, but so many people were saying, can you show me around? So I got licensed and infused, you know, I was a photographer, kind of honed that skill. So yeah, just seeing how it's developed and wherever you're at now, know that it is truly endless. Like you're imagining the limit is only as 
small is your imagination. What's the saying? I feel like I'm forgetting the saying that I'm trying to say. <laughs> the sky is the limit. <laughs> but really, like, there's no cap on what you could do. The products you can create, the partnerships. Like, I've had such cool partnerships working with different tourism boards and brands and things that I just never thought were possible. But because, like, I'm my own boss and I get to make the decisions in my company, it's just cool being able to constantly be creative and be challenged and see what new things come my way. So hopefully that made sense. That was sort of a weird route to take, but truly I didn't, when I started, I had no idea the possibilities. Um, mm -hmm. And even if you're like, you know, having trouble growing your traffic, just stick with it and try to figure out what is wrong and how to fix that. Because there was a long time that I was like, I want to get into Mediavine. Why am I not able to hit that point? Like I'm mm. publishing all the time and I realized there was some things I was doing wrong. You know, figure out what that is, revamp your strategy as needed, check in with yourself. If you're doing the same thing for six months, seeing no results, why is that? Mm. Um, but you can get over that hump. It's not you. It's probably one thing that you're doing wrong or two things that just need to be tweaked. So check in with your strategies, revamp when needed, and know that what you're trying to get is possible. Look yeah. at those who are already doing it and use them as a model to be like, okay, this is possible. They're doing it, I can do it too. So that was yeah. my tangent. <laughs> that was my tangent, and that's what became one of my mottos that you almost touched on verbatim, is uh, if they could, I can. Like yeah. if somebody else could do this, I could do it. And I felt that way from the beginning, everybody just listening to podcasts every single day on my way to my job in Chicago and thinking I could do this. Yeah, I could do this. And then I think I said that to myself every day for like four years because, you know, you don't feel like you're, you know, there yet. And you never, not that like you are, you know, arrive one day or something at like being successful, that bar moves <laughs> and it changes meaning. But yeah, just that belief and hearing encouragement from so many people. I know podcasts were really fundamental and me not quit giving up <laughs> even after I started my first blog two blogs and quit them and kind of coming back for a third try and um, I've heard this piece of advice and I'm curious if you agree with it that the only people who fail at blogging are the ones that quit and how if you had kept going you would have figured it out yeah I totally agree I think you know there's like a similar quote that's like the only time you fail is if you don't try because then you'll you know Mm -hmm. You never even gave yourself the chance to succeed. But I, I don't know. I feel like success has also come in steps. Like when I first launched my membership, my initial enrollment was very small. It took time to build the content and the community. So the, if I would have given up and been like, oh, like so few people want this. Mm. I never would be where I am now where I feel like it is very successful. So same with the tours. Like when I first started, I think I was giving one a month and now I'm giving, I gave three yesterday, you know, and now wow. I'm giving one today. So this took time. Like it was steps. Like that's why it kind of goes back to what I said before, track your progress, like have a one day a month where you're kind of checking in and seeing, I do this with my membership. We do it once a month. We meet on a call. What worked last month and what didn't work? Hmm figure out where you need to like change things and where maybe you want to put more energy. Like when I was starting to build my list, that actually happened for me pretty quickly in terms of like, I was seeing a pretty straight up success. So I put a lot of energy into that. I was like, okay, this is working. I'm going to keep doing this. And it really paid off where there's certain things I've tried where I haven't seen that success. And I've either changed my strategy or said, man, do I really need to continue with this? Maybe I'll just stop doing this and do something else where my time will be better spent. And I feel like these check-ins are invaluable because if you're just going, going, going without checking in, you could be doing the wrong thing for years. And then in two years, you're like, wait, I still don't really have traffic. I'm still not monetizing. You have to check in. Mm, yeah. And I would like to add to that to track it in a spreadsheet to try to become a spreadsheet person. And <laughs> I know I, whenever I was trying, starting to pitch people, I had this feeling like I am pitching all the time and I am rejected all the time. And I really believed this. I thought I was actually, I was posting on Instagram one day about how <laughs> I had put, pitched like 40 publications in the year. And I decided to go back and check my spreadsheet. And there were like eight I was so far off because I was like, emotionally, I felt like I was making it up. You know, I was bigger in my mind than it was in reality. And 
you know, we don't have someone here to, you know, we don't have a boss or a teammate to be like, no, you haven't tried enough or you just haven't tried that much. It's not about, you know, right or wrong, but the data is the data. So like kind of collecting data on yourself, I think is also, that was kind of a big eye opener for me that um, things were, I wasn't trying that much. I was thinking about it. I wasn't doing it. <laughs> yeah. And oh, I'm adding one thing to that. Keep a, um, I keep a screenshot folder in Google Drive of, um, it's like my wins. Oh, so when people that. leave a good review for a tour, when people email me saying they loved a course or even an opt-in freebie, if Lonely Planet retweets me, like anything that's gonna like give me a boost of, mm. wow, what I'm doing matters or it's getting seen or, you know, this feels good and I'm heading in the right direction. Screenshot that stuff. So then when you're feeling a little down or you need that little boost, you can look at those screenshots and remind yourself that you are having an impact. Oh, that's such a nice note to end this on. <laughs> Before, well, if you will fill us in, you have so many. You said that your um, people who come to your blog sometimes comment on how much you have. And I also had that feeling <laughs> whenever I looked into the business side of like all of the tools and the freebies and the audits and everything. So why don't you just fill us in? Because I know that anyone who's still listening at this point has something that you, <laughs> they you could help them for sure. <laughs> Well, the best place to go, so I've jessianajourney.com. In the menu, you can click the blogging button. I've got blogging freebies over there. That's always a great place to start. Free course, free webinars, free resource library. Um, I have my Profitable Travel Blogger podcast where I give all, you know, 20 minute or less strategies, how to grow your email list, how to work with brands, how to launch a giveaway, like all kinds of things. Um, I have a YouTube channel, How to Make Money Travel Blogging with Jesse on a Journey. That name is way too long, but anyway, that's what it is. <laughs> and I have a bunch of courses, but the main kind of my my baby, I'll call it, is Travel Blog Prosperity that we've been talking about. 75 plus courses and workshops in there, thousands of dollars worth of bonuses, pitch templates, Trello workflows, all different kinds of things. And if anyone's interested, Is Kayla it? can give you a coupon and a link and uh, you can try it out. Cancel it literally anytime, even before the trial month is over. You can literally go in and just grab the bonuses if you want, whatever. Uh, I recommend you stay though for the courses and the group calls, which are a lot of fun for networking and Q and A's, but yeah. Any questions also, you can just email me at jesse at jessianajourney.com and I'm happy to chat about blogging, travel, you know, whatever. Oh, that was so nice. Thank you so much for sharing. I feel like there were like just dozens of nuggets of gold in there. And thank you so much for sharing them with us. Yes, thank you for having me. Jessie is amazing. If you joined her travel blog, Prosperity, you'll see me in there. I'm also a member. If you enjoyed this video and you're enjoying these interview series, please give this a thumbs up and a comment and a subscribe. It's so impactful for my channel to help it grow if you're enjoying the content. Also, so that I know that you're enjoying these series and to keep making more of them. I can't wait to see you next time. Thanks for watching.